Hello again, this is Eric. And I'm Ashley. And today we wanted to talk about um, a couple of concepts that I think are important for not getting hoodwinked when you're looking at arguments, um, whether those arguments are contained in journalistic news sources or in um, the sort of opinion editorial sources, right? The blogosphere um, or, or wherever you encounter those opinions. And, th and those two concepts are overgeneralization and oversimplification. Right, overgeneralization, oversimplification. Those sound fairly similar, but they have an important distinction that we want to um, address today. Both overgeneralization and oversimplification are what we call rhetorical fallacies. And, and I know a lot of you are dealing with rhetorical fallacies, have done rhetorical fallacy work in your class, so this will hopefully make those less um, more robust or, or, or provide more depth or, or, or a good review. Um, they're not necessarily overgeneralization and oversimplification are not necessarily types of fallacies, although they can be, but they tend to be more categories where other kinds of fallacies fall. So they're like umbrella terms, and then you see other specific instances of rhetorical fallacies in these, in these arguments. Generally, the distinction is overgeneralization is going to overgeneralize people, groups of people, right, communities, it's going to make assumptions or assertions about communities that sort of flatten that community, don't give that community their full say or their full do, right, so basically it's a form of producing misunderstanding, which is exactly opposite from what we want to do, right, on the other hand, oversimplification is going to be a form of flattening somebody's or some group's ideas, okay, so overgeneralization is a lot like stereotyping, Right, which y'all know a lot about um, because you've encountered it in other critical situations. And oversimplification is sort of the stereotyping of ideas. Okay, so Ashley will talk a little bit about overgeneralization. I'll talk a little bit about oversimplification. We'll use the Dream Act as an example, um, and then we'll we'll wrap up this video talking about applying these two terms. Okay, and then and, and next week you'll actually look at some specific fallacies. These are common fallacies. We have an instructor here at the University of Texas who's an expert in these fallacies and she's going to walk you through some some common ones and then we have some practice activities for you. So overgeneralization. Great. Well as Eric's already explained, um, overgeneralization occurs when you or another writer takes a group of people and makes a very sweeping statement about that group that um, again, I think the word flattening is a really good way to look at it. It just flattens the difference and the uniqueness um, and all of the specifics of this group's um, identity into one very general statement. Um, oftentimes, we use the word stereotype um, and prejudice even to describe the effects of overgeneralization. I think it is important to note that not all thing has to be negative, but um, very frequently in our society when we stereotype a group, um, for example, when people make the argument that all Mexicans are coming to steal our jobs in America, that kind of statement is clearly overgeneralizing a very diverse group of people um, who come to the United States for very different reasons, and um, a statement such as that one is not only prejudicial and stereotypical, but it is irresponsible argumentation, um, which, as Eric pointed out, produces misunderstandings about people which is the opposite of what we want to do with this class. Our goal as rhetoricians is to produce better understanding um, in our society and of other people. So what you want to look out for, um, you want to be a savvy reader and you want to see when other people are making claims that overgeneralize. You want to be very on top of that. Um, and we're going to do some practice in your class today on identifying that. But one of the best ways, I think, to find overgeneralization and to be wary of it is to look at the language that somebody uses, to look for words that are very extreme, um, that make sweeping judgments. Words like always or all or even most um, is a great encompassment. Or on the other hand, words like never or none of. Um, those types of words, when used in a sentence, they tend to make a claim about a very large group that, in fact, it might be more responsible to say some, or a few of, or in certain instances. Um, so we're going to have you look at the language of opinion pieces. You know, as, as you see people making arguments in the news media, you want to look really carefully at how they're making that argument. Are they making these sweeping judgments where they encompass one group of people? 
um, in a single claim? Or are they being much more responsible about drawing boundaries around their judgment? Um, are they saying that, sure, in certain instances, you might see an immigrant population taking jobs that Americans might have, but noting that that's obviously not always the situation for everyone. Um, thoughts on Would, I mean, a lot of time, stereotypical statements are, are fairly obvious, right? Uh, and they're obvious because they're unfair. Why they're unfair, I think that's the value added for this lesson. Why they're unfair, we argue, is because they disallow that group from engaging in argument, right? They, they disallow that group from producing understanding because there's no attempt on the part of the arguer or the reservoir to allow that, that, that understanding to occur. And, and you know why this happens, right? This, this is not a surprise to you. This happens based on, a lot of times, the ideologies and commonplaces that are shared by a community, okay? And these, these are misinformation or assumptions that are unsubstantiated based on race, class, gender, sexuality, religion, politics, so forth and so forth, right? Um, so you can see why stereotyping occurs. It occurs because a group either does not have or does not wish to have uh, a certain amount of information about another group or another person, right? Um, and you and hopefully you can see why it's, why it's unfair and why it, it, it prevents the sort of arguments that we want to teach you to have, right? It prevents civic literacy. It prevents public discourse. Oversimplification is basically the same thing as overgeneralization, although here we want to focus on, again, the ideas of other people. Okay, So take Ashley's example of illegal immigrants and the concept that they come over here to take American jobs. That flattens a whole complex series of issues that have to do with unemployment rates, why those rates exist, what economic factors are involved, what groups are involved, who the stakeholders are. You probably did a lot of research about this in the fall. Um, so I, I think I can just talk for a couple minutes about why that's a, a flattening and oversimplification of a complex idea. First of all, since we want to produce understanding, we want to be transparent in our arguments, we have to admit that, yes, maybe there are instances in which an illegal immigrant has come over and taken a job that would have gone to an American. That probably happens. There are probably data on the extent to which that happens. And so probably the strongest arguments are going to seek out and cite that research. It's a logistical appeal, right? Pretty basic. Um, but clearly, that can't be the case for every job in America, right? First of all, <clears throat> we know that Unemployment today is about 10%, a little less than 10%, okay? Um, and we know that that 10% unemployment is not necessarily caused because of mass illegal immigration, right? There are other factors that have to do with the recession, right? And that recession has to do with the way our banking and investment structure is set up. Um, it also has to do with the extent to which companies and other business owners, small and large, feel that they can hire, okay? And so you have to take all of that into account before you can really, I think, make a statement about um, whether or not there's a direct correlation, a cause and effect between illegal immigration and mass, un and mass unemployment, okay? And of course, it's more complicated than we've suggested here, but, but just as, as, as a, a brief example of the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, any, anything about that that we should talk about that I, that I missed? No, I think that was a great explanation. Um, and at this point in your research, as you're looking at the news coverage of your candidate, um, what we're hoping you can start with is observing these issues of oversimplification and overgeneralization as they might occur in the news coverage and being wary of, of when you see that happening. Uh, later in the semester, when you actually produce your own persuasive writing, it's going to be incumbent upon you to avoid oversimplification and overgeneralization yourself. So this is a lesson that you should keep fresh in your mind through the remainder of the semester, both as a reader and as a writer. Absolutely, absolutely. So you can you, you can see hopefully how, how this is applicable. We've spent a lot of time in the fall and in this semester uh, looking at the ways rhetorical strategies are being used in helpful ways. And help employed, employed successfully, employed for the benefits of promoting argument, right? Uh, reducing misunderstanding, producing understanding, making sure that a red or, or somebody who's making an argument is, is being understood by an audience. But here you can see that um, 
there are moments where arguments are disallowed from continuing. And we'll talk more about this when we get to Stacy's, about, about what particular kinds of moments those are, what characteristics those moments share. But for now, I think it, it, it suffices to say that fallacies, right? Moments where arguments break, moments where arguments can't continue. Now, here's the tricky part. I think we have to admit that there may not be anything as a, a fallacy. They may, they may not exist. They may be non-existent. Why? Well, think about everything you've learned about audience up to this point, right? We talked about the primacy of, audien, of audience to arguments, right? That arguments exist for audiences. And once a rhetoric figures out, this is who my audience is, and this is what I think I need, they need to hear, then you offer them those things, right? And so if you make a fallacious statement, a fallacy-laden statement, Right. Let's say you overgeneralize an illegal immigrant population from Mexico, or let's say you uh, oversimplify the cause and effect between illegal immigration and unemployment in America. If you do that and your group is primed to hear that because you're arguing to those people who believe the same way, they're going to believe it. They're not going to call that a fallacy, are they? Right? They're going to say, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's how illegal immigrants are. Or, yeah, that is, an, uh, that is an effective cause and effect, right? Does not mean that that is a correct argument. It means it is an accepted argument. And that's the key. That's why fallacies are useful, because we're interested here in arguments that strive for transparency, for accuracy, for admitting their strengths and their weaknesses, okay? For admitting that other people may not accept this. Right, and there's a lot of damage done in that type of accepted argument. Uh, it reinforces stereotypes. It prevents communities from understanding each other better. Um, so these instances of, of rhetorical fallacies that we're beginning to talk about today, even if an audience willingly accepts those fallacies, the general larger project of civic understanding and you know, community building uh, is, is hurt by those, which is why we want to avoid them and to be very wary of when we see them in another argument. Yeah, our goal, we're arguing, the class argues, the rhetoric 306 argues, uh, argument is about continuing the argument. It's about continuing the discussion. Or sometimes we use that word conversation. You think back to those synthesis essays and we say basically what you're doing is you're, you're mapping a conversation. Okay? Um, so we always want to make argumentative steps or use argumentative strategies that allow further conversation. That's the kind of argument that we want. There are other kinds of arguments, right? The most opposite and obvious of which is the one that does not allow for further conversation. And so fallacies are moments where that happens. And what we're suggesting is sort of two broad categories of fallacies that you encounter. The overgeneralization, right? The flattening of groups of people and their characteristics and their beliefs. And then oversimplification of um, the ideas that people have, which again has to do with who they are and what they believe, right? Um, so again, next week we'll talk about some specific fallacies. But basically, all those specific fallacies, what they do is interrupt the flow of conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Good Thank luck. You.